I think most people can understand that the climate and how it impacts our projects and particularly how we design structures, we have these forces of nature that have un, never been seen before, right? Like hurricanes and floods and fire and extreme heat. Um, all of this is, is really impacting how structural engineers need to design our projects. Um, I think uh, not as well understood, um, but, but really affecting us. And what I want to emphasize and talk about today is how our projects actually impact our climate and how we, in the emissions that are generated in construction and in the materials we use to make our buildings, that actually exacerbates, it can exacerbate um, uh, what's happening with, with climate change um, unless we start to really take action and change the way in how we build. Um, so first of all, some, some definitions, just to make sure all the terminology I use is, is understood. Um, so carbon, quote unquote, uh, has become a shorthand for carbon dioxide equivalents, uh, which is a unit of measure for all greenhouse gases that affect our climate. And a scientific term is actually called global warming potential. Uh, and global warming potential is, yeah, it's the, when you see CO2E, that's the carbon dioxide equivalents, that's the unit. Um, and then carbon in our built environment, there's, there's uh, two kinds, the embodied carbon and operational carbon. So operational carbon, I'm sure you know, everyone's more familiar with, uh, it's coming from building energy consumption. And embodied carbon is referring to the carbon that comes from everything from manufacture, transportation, insulation, and construction of materials, even through the whole life of the building actually. And, um, and when we replace and have to refurbish and then the end of life and what happens to those materials when the, the building has served its useful life. Uh, and the, uh, you know, for a long time, the focus was on operational energy, right? Um, a typical building over the typical building life, operational energy is, is, to, is usually the majority and embodied carbon was smaller. People didn't think it was significant and pay as much attention. But with the reduction of operational energy, which has been great, um, even coming into building codes and, and um, green building certification and uh, a lot of effort in that realm, uh, the proportion of embodied carbon then becomes greater, right? It's becoming more significant. And then on top of that, we have um, this new time frame. And so it's not the whole life. We don't get the, you know, life of a building could be uh, 75 years, something pretty long. Um, we only have until 2050. Uh, that's when uh, the, you know, international um, panel of scientists and the whole international community has, has really rallied around an understanding that by 2050, we have to be carbon neutral, um, especially from our built environment. Uh, so if we only look at the next 30 years, then the embodied carbon is a much larger portion of new construction. Okay. And then to exacerbate that even more, we are building basically in another New York City every 35 days. The, the rate at which we are creating cities um, around the world. So this is mostly happening, uh, not in the US, um, in, in the you know, growing to more developing countries, but um, we, they model a lot of what, how they build is modeled after what we've done um, in, in the US. So we have to change um, uh, at this uh, because of um, uh, all of these, you know, multiple effects. So if that doesn't, um, if you feel overwhelmed <laughs> by all those factors of converging on each other, um, luckily there are some really fantastic organizations that have been paying attention to this. Uh, the, the internationally leading one out there is called the Carbon Leadership Forum. It's based out of the University of Washington, and it's now it's become an international network. Um, and they created this roadmap to zero car embodied carbon buildings, uh, which really shows the number of different entities that need to get together and work together um, and towards what we call carbon smart building materials. Um, and then critical within that is the architect and engineer's role. And, and we are you know, um, really necessary uh, in working together towards these changes. Uh, within Arab, we have a framework that I have found helpful in thinking about, okay, what do you do about this? What do we do about 
uh, getting to net zero carbon. And what I like is that it presents a loading order, right? Like the priorities um, uh, as that ideally you would start with building nothing. So this is an order of what's most effective at reducing the body carbon. Um, and then you get to building less, building clever, which encapsulates multiple things like reusing materials and choosing low carbon materials, building more efficiently, you know, using less material for the same function um, and minimizing waste. Um, uh, it's sometimes it's debated a little bit whether building clever and build efficiently, you could kind of flip flop those. Um, it really depends on your project. Uh, but I think overall, this is a it's a helpful framework to think about um, a, kind of the, the way to approach a project and what's most effective. Now, at the same time, the timing matters, right? So when you do these, um, what happens is that those highly effective choices you lose them as the project continues. So building nothing, of course, um, quite often, unfortunately, uh, architects and engineers are not involved in that decision. Uh, an owner will come to us after they decided to build something. <laughs> um, so um, it, it, it's difficult to actually have an effect there. Um, we're actually, uh, but we're seeing more and more that uh, architects and engineers are getting involved with policy, especially urban planning policy that can help with the build nothing. Uh, and then we have build less, build clever, build efficiently, and, and so on. Um, and so what you see, of course, is that, yeah, as a you get into design, construction, and then definitely once you're in o &M, there's there's less opportunity to reduce carbon. Okay, so um, now I'm going to get into five things. Now that we're like focusing on structure. Um, the five ways, you know, you know, because there are there's lists, there's endless lists of things that you can ask your structural engineer to do um, to help reduce embodied carbon on projects. So when I'm trying to uh, distill it down to what are the top five? So this is this is my opinion, <laughs> um, but it, it's it's based on years of, of being um, you know in this practice and and things that we've learned a lot of things we've learned within Arab. Uh, so. Again, um, you'll also see that this uh, follows roughly that loading order. So reusing existing buildings and components, maximizing material efficiency, reducing the cement and concrete, using timber instead of concrete and steel, that's materials, and then uh, design for circularity. Okay, so, so why focus on structure though? Um, the, this is a study we did quite a while ago, but um, it, it's, seems to be that the um, when we see new studies come out that it's roughly in line with what we found here um, so structure would be the superstructure and substructure and it it's usually the majority or more of that upfront embodied carbon um, upfront mean is referring to the embodied the emissions up to when um, everything comes to site um, so uh, you know, whether it's school, hospital, office, like different types of buildings, uh, structure is usually the majority. And then uh, if we think more in the global view, um, you can kind of, it makes sense because the materials that we use in structure, concrete, steel, um, some aluminum, more aluminum goes into the envelope, um, but that is an enormous piece of the global greenhouse gas emissions pie. And again, for, for such a long time, we only focused on building operations, energy use, and the emissions from that. And, you know, but there's this whole portion that was in industry that used to be just grouped in industry that the buildings industry is now recognizing, the buildings community is saying, you know what, we need to own that too. We need to take responsibility for that too, because we have an effect on it. Um, and then if you understand, you know, how these materials are made, structural materials of concrete and steel, uh, they are really high energy, um, like, you know, industrial levels of heat, these processes, plus uh, the cement and concrete, there's additional emissions that come from a chemical reaction, um, but I'll get into that later. But yeah, if, if you ever actually see these materials being made, it's just, um, it, it starts, it makes sense why there's such an enormous amount of carbon emissions that come from them. Okay, so the first strategy is the reuse existing buildings and components. Um, so I, I've always appreciated the study um, by um, a Preservation Green Lab and, and their partners. Um, it looked at, you know, how many years would it take for a more energy efficient new building to pay off its body carbon? So the, the concept is, you know, there's an argument, oh, well, but if we 
build a new building and we can start fresh and have a super efficient building. So that's still better than trying to, uh, you know, use an existing building and, and be constrained and um, not have as good of energy efficiency. So what they did is looked at different climates and different types of buildings. Um, and they basically debunked that, you know, that argument. And because it can take, there's quite a range here, but it can take from 10 to 80 years um, for that embodied carbon to pay off, which is really telling us, okay, that we, that we don't have that amount of time. We really need to start looking at reusing existing buildings, but also upgrading the operational energy performance while we're reusing them. Um, and it can lead to some really beautiful buildings as well, like reusing existing buildings when there's um, some you know, element to that existing architecture that you're preserving and showcasing. Usually those buildings are loved more um, and uh, even more because of that history that becomes evident and people love you know, feeling like they're in a building that has that past. Um, uh, so this is an example of uh, on the right was uh, um, an old aircraft hangar that was um, has been converted into Google's office space. And then on the left was actually um, a building that was um, vacant for, for almost a decade. And then they repurposed it and actually added two stories of um, timber on top to um, make it worth it for the developer to you know, have that additional square footage. And then of course, there's reuse of components, you know, so not the whole building, but, but components. Um, on the left uh, is an example of reusing some elements that were part of the, um, the big dig project in Boston, um, an infrastructure project actually. And then on the right, it's um, NREL actually took these pipe columns from um, uh, decommissioned oil and gas distribution. Um, so this is, um, yeah, these are some really neat examples, but you know, there's, there's examples of lots of other kinds of materials that can be reused, uh, structural materials, probably steel is the most common um, and easy to do it with. Um, but uh, right now we also do have some challenges, unfortunately. Um, definitely the, um, uh, this, uh, this is trying to show actually the uh, costs of um, when we use steel, which is ordinarily recycled content anyway. So, you know, I would just say it like buying new steel and then um, versus salvaged steel. Yes, the material is cheaper, but we have all these additional steps um, and, and questions. And ultimately that risk of, uh, you know, an owner not feeling as comfortable of getting into something that they're not totally sure about and how it's going to affect schedule, especially, and then, and costs. Um, that's what's preventing us a lot of times right now. Um, and, but I, the, you know, these are things that, this is the reality, but these are the things that we need to overcome if, if we really want to use our materials in a, in a more, you know, circular way and, and reduce the embodied carbon in them. Okay. So then the second one was um, maximizing material efficiency. And, and this one I also really love because of, how architects and structural engineers can work together. Um, so uh, first is a reminder that, you know, different structural systems have their optimal utilization. Um, if you have a certain span, especially, or in load combination, but there are certain systems that are best fit for that. And what I feel like we see, unfortunately, is a lot of kind of like dismissal of that or ignoring it and just going for a certain look or, um, a certain floor depth often also in controls. And, and unfortunately that turns into, that can turn into really inefficient and very heavy structure um, uh, when, you know, really it should be moving towards the more like cellular or, or trust systems um, when we get stuck with the concrete flat slab. Um, and, and so this is just um, really trying to encourage you to, to think about material efficiency even in traditional sense, but then going even beyond that, um, we have some really neat geometry and um, that can come out when uh, the architect and our and structural engineer are working together and trying to find that optimal geometry, letting the form of the, um, of the whole space actually follow efficiency. Um, and, you know, the concept is pretty simple. It's, the idea that embodied carbon um, 
is calculated through this equation of you have dimensional quantities multiplied by embodied carbon coefficients or factors, and you get embodied carbon. So, of course, when you minimize materials, then that's going to help minimize embodied carbon. And what I like to say, though, is that material efficiency is like the new energy efficiency, because um, energy efficiency is, is, you know, it's so deep in the vocabulary of green building. Um, I think that us thinking about material efficiency should be the same. Uh, and it's usually like a wide variety of examples of how, you know, different uh, ideas, more and more novel ideas of how you can introduce that on projects. So um, starting from the upper right, that's a bubble deck. It just helps to um, you know create all these voids in your in the, especially when a concrete slab is very thick. Um, maybe even for more of a foundation or a slab on grade that's very very thick. Um, and then um, uh, next is the cellular beams. Um, so you know if any of you have had structures classes yet, or even if you're, I mean maybe just even just intuitively, um, you know the deeper the the deeper you can get your uh, your member. Um, the more um, it's going to work for you, but then you don't really need as much of the material in the middle. So that's what that's trying to do. It's trying to just remove material where it's not really needed. Um, and then same with the hollow core slabs. With hollow core, it's kind of neat because uh, there have seen some projects utilize uh, the the hollow <laughs> hollowed part and actually deliver air. Um, uh, just use it for um, delivery of MEP, and then. Um, over here is a fabric form. Um, so actually using a form for a concrete uh, cast in place concrete, but letting the the uh, the shape of the concrete um, you know also be much more efficient. Um, then we have um, this is the I don't know if you've heard of the Gustavino vaulting system. Um, this is a prefab. Just thinking about prefab and how that can minimize a lot of waste that's generated normally in fabrication. Um, and then going all the way to the idea of 3D printing, additive material manufacture, um, and and really, you know, only that that is really only putting material where it's needed. Uh, and and then lastly, within this realm of thinking is um, computational optimization, right? Like we can do so much more these days in getting efficient because of how quickly we can run through these, um, you know, paradigmatic optimization. Um, and then, so one example is where uh, for uh, we, we design a lot of airports um, for these really long spans. Um, this project that we got to do with um, Fosters and Partners um, for the um, the new it's actually the picture I saw as you saw a few slides ago that um, uh, it was able to achieve uh, the structural efficiency that is much much less. So like the forty two to fifty four. Um, uh, kilograms per meter squared. I'm sorry, that's a metric, but um, it's just in comparison to all these other projects that we, we dug up and looked at what was the material usage of those projects for similar spans. And um, yeah, it just, it, it undercut it so much because again, because the uh, engineer and architect were just, you know, working together to, to say, we, you know, we, this is what we want. We're gonna just explore these geometries and, and choose something that's super efficient. Um, so I'll just, I'll show you real quick, actually, which one I was referring to. That's the inside of that same structure. So basically, there's not, I mean, what would you call a column or a beam? There's like not really a column or a beam, right? It's just an entire um, uh, um, system that, that is just trying to, you know, span these enormous volumes. Um, and then uh, similar with um, concrete. You know that that uh, we get stuck with this thinking that they, uh, you know, flat slab even if it's post tensioned. Um, but there have been explorations, like real projects that have built some really unique slabs that, again, like just use material um, very minimally, um, and now translate that from the 1970s to now. Um, there's a research group uh, in Zurich that at ETH Zurich that is looking at, you know, with additive manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing again, that how do you, you know, replicate that, but actually make it much less labor intensive. Uh, and then we, in, in Arab, we ran some studies looking into that too, and just seeing, okay, how, how far can you go? 
So we looked at the slab efficiencies um, of, you know, really traditional flat slab, then you move to waffle slabs that were more popular, you know, decades ago, but there's a lot built. And then, um, and then that, that nervy inspired sheep slab. Um, and what we found was that there was an enormous amount of uh, material savings in moving that direction. So this is what we call, if you say, you know, unity is the flat slab two-way spanning, um, and then you add PT, and then you add, you know, use, get into all those systems um, that really are just, you know, following your load path and following your, where's your, where your stresses, um, then you can achieve up to, like, you know, that's like a 30 uh, percent um, that's only a third of what um, a third of what a flat slab would be. So that's like a sixty-six percent savings, right? Okay, so that was material efficiency. Um, I hope that inspired gave you some inspiration. Um, now we're going to talk about concrete, which not all architects <laughs> are, uh, are thrilled about concrete, uh, but but I am, and I'm going to try to get you interested in concrete in, the, in this next portion. Um, so first of all, uh, just to give you an idea of how much, how significant concrete is um, for almost every kind of project, whether it's a um, steel, concrete, or timber project, there's going to be, there's like almost inevitably going to be concrete in it. Uh, so the yellowish colors here are from concrete, and then the, the largest, um, the, the carbon emissions, sorry, the carbon emissions from concrete, and the largest uh, slice of yellow is from cement, and here this will show better why. Um, the uh, this is the, your normal um, kind of volumetric proportioning of concrete mix. You know you have mostly the aggregate um, and and sand and water and cement in there, uh, but cement is pretty small. But the amount of um, emissions and the the proportion is mostly from the cement. In fact, cement worldwide is about 7% of uh, contributing to, to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it's, it's an, an enormous polluter. Um, and you contrast that to, you know, I think a lot of us think like, oh, yes, flying, like, you know, I thought, oh, flying, that's, that's going to be high emissions. Try to avoid that. But um, cement is even high. It's like oh, more than double it. So whatever you can do on your projects um, is going to be really helpful. And then I'll try to show some of the thinking that we've had in the Bay Area. Um, uh, okay, so what, what is good to know is that there's an enormous range in the embodied carbon of concrete. So this is a graph that goes along with strengths, like the, the strength that your engineer would specify concrete, and, um, and then the global warming potential. So there's a huge range, um, and the strength is the primary uh, specification, right? It's the primary function that the concrete needs. It also needs lots of other things. Um, so you can't rely just on strength. Um, you can't pick, you know, any of these mixes to work. Um, but but just to know that there's quite a, a variety in there, and that it's and it's not. Um, uh, the, and finding that it's it's often an overuse of cement. That the it's it's just more than is really necessary. So we got together in the Bay Area, um, a team actually with the Carbon Leadership Forum, Arab, and an and, and Ecological Building Network, um, uh, and introduced this idea of could we have a code, a building code amendment um, that is adopted by local jurisdictions that puts a cap on the embodied carbon of concrete. Um, so in either doing it by uh, capping cement content or capping the embodied carbon. Um, and so you see here, that's also by strength. And, uh, and it's based actually off of industry data for what is an, what they call an industry-wide EPD, Environmental Product Declaration. Um, but the association, the National Ready Mix Association, um, publishes every few years, they publish what is industry average. And so we use that as a benchmark and said, you know, we believe our region can do a little bit better than that. And actually gather the, all that data you saw on that scatter plot. That was collected by the Structural Engineers Association of Northern California, SIONC, um, and, and that's what is shown in the blue bars. So we said, okay, well, there's the average, the um, industry, that's the dash line, data line, and this is where we're going to set our limit, and then there's all this data to support 
yes, it should be possible in the Bay Area. There's over 300 mixes that um, we collected. And then um, this is just a contrast. Okay, when you uh, are using straight cement versus, um, sorry, that's over there. If you're using straight cement versus using cement replacement materials, then you can meet the code without with the straight cement mixes, then you, you'll have a hard time. And so why are we talking about like cement and um, global warm or yeah, the embodied carbon um, when you're probably thinking, why not talk about recycled content? Um, Cause that's, that's been the traditional way of thinking about um, uh, low carbon concrete is the percent of you know, what you're placing it with, whether fly ash or slag, these other materials that can act like cementitious, um, cementitiously. Uh, well, the problem with recycled content, recycled content's been in lead for a really long time. Um, so uh, is that you can say, okay, we're going to, we want to achieve this 50% recycled content, but then a contractor can give you a mix that achieves recycled content, but all they did was increase the amount of cementitious materials because it's a percentage of what the, you know, fly ash or slag is um, to all of the cementitious. So it's the, you have cement, slag, fly ash. And, and they can just increase all of it to, to meet that 50% and not actually increase the, um, the cement that much. So that's why we're really trying to get, um, you know, the buildings industry to talk about cement limits or global warming potential limits and not just rely on recycled content anymore. So sorry, that was a little bit, I just had to get that in there. <laughs> um, um, okay, so the main trade-off, the main trade-off with um, reducing cement and concrete uh it, it's slower to gain strength and it's really hard for a contractor um but what happens is that eventually over time it usually exceeds the strength of a pure cement mix um so that's what you see the dark blue is like a 100 cement and then when you see there it, it, it's so it's so common to use recycled <laughs> recycle content but um, um uh, you see all these other blends that have uh, cement replacements and uh, they start off slower in strength, but they exceed the 100% cement mix in strength eventually. Uh, so we take advantage of that. Oops. Um, by uh, oh, by by being particular about which elements get you know we're really aggressive with. So we can be really aggressive with the elements that don't need strength really early, um, like the foundation and not as aggressive with elements where the contractor does need strength early. Um, and that's usually, you know, because they need to put load on it, they need to strip the forms. There's things in construction that where they, they are gonna really impact schedule um, if you were to try to replace cement everywhere. Um, so, you know, we have a strategy and this was a little bit unusual with a precast. There isn't usually so much savings with precast, but um, in this case, there was the first precast mix they introduced was just, just had so much cement in it. We're just I think that's really not necessary, and we we're able to reduce that too. Um, but ultimately, for this project, we were able to save uh, twenty thousand tons of CO two. That's that's quite a lot. And but with a really um, bottom line, the headline there is that there is no additional cost for doing this. Um, uh, when you uh, there's, there's often kind of a threshold um, that you can at least achieve some amount of uh, cement replacement. Um, yeah, without affecting costs very much, without affecting schedule very much, if you do it very strategically, and that is why collaboration is really key um, for, for the strategy with concrete. Uh, you know, the, there's, uh, of course, your engineer, us, the engineer and architects, but also with the owner, um, suppliers, contractors, and then even testing labs, if you start early enough, you can start testing new mixes. Um, and then now what we're seeing too is policymakers such as with the low carbon concrete code in the Bay Area are coming in and also really trying to address this problem we have with, with uh, cement and concrete. Um, so on our project, um, the other thing to just point out is that um, a lot of, especially the policy being introduced, um, it'll put the burden on the contractor, but I wanna just let you know that that is too late. Uh, we, the, the contractor is going to follow specifications and specifications come from us. So um, it really needs to start earlier in a project. And here you'll see, especially for the low carbon, this is from um, one of the pilot projects of a low carbon concrete code that, um, yeah, we had to overhaul 
the specifications to, to meet the uh, with that the, those code limits were. And here are some some examples because um, I feel like I've been showing you examples. I should show you some examples of the um, uh, of this as well. That there are a number of projects that have um, met those code limits or, or use this approach of specifying maximums of um, either cement or or bond carbon. Oh, sorry, um, and uh, yeah, but you know, uh, really, I think that's going to take off across the country, um, and and we're hoping that there's. Um, you know, that's really a model code and it's going to come into other jurisdictions too. Um, okay, so then the fourth one was um, uh, timber, using timber instead of concrete and steel. Uh, so this graph is trying to show your uh, global warming potential and with concrete, like, you know, it increases over the, the that life, right? The, the life of the product um, and but with timber, the idea is you have a plant-based product. So in the growth, even you know, uh, the that raw material stage, um, it you've absorbed this. Your trees have absorbed all this carbon, and then it gets locked in and stored in your building product um, for as long as the, the the life of that product, you know, until until its end of life. Um, even with trans, we did some city state of transportation. Even with different transportation scenarios, um, you still get that huge, huge benefit. Um, so, uh, you know, using bio-based materials like timber um, and the ability for mass timber to replace concrete and steel is really exciting. Uh, and this idea that building materials are the only path for buildings and infrastructure to become a carbon sink, like to to do that, to actually take CO two out and store it um, that, uh, you know, I think that's really special about our buildings. Um, it's not something that operational carbon could say, but, but we have that opportunity when we, we're thinking about embodied carbon. Um, so these are, this is an example of a bunch of different kinds of um, building products. So this is going beyond structural now, but um, yeah, we have our CLT across laminated timber, laminated timber, the mass timber on the left, but then there are a number of, especially like insulation products. There's a lot of insulation products that um, can, can do this carbon sequestering. Um, and then even there's even concrete, um, some new concrete technologies that are starting to find ways to uh, inject CO2 and utilize CO2 um, and store it. Uh, uh, this, uh, if you're interested in that concept, then this is a book I highly recommend, The New Carbon Architecture. Um, but uh, what the one other uh, idea I wanna make sure um, I share with you is that when we talk about um, sourcing building products from ecosystems like our forests that we can't miss our effect on the forest and the opportunity to have a beneficial effect on the forest actually. Um, so, so, you know, emissions of um, products and that's what we've been talking about, that's all this other stuff. But when we look at the carbon um, flow for a forest, it's enormous, like it's magnitudes more than these emissions that are happening in manufacture. Um, especially for wood, because wood has pretty low manufacturing energy intensity. Uh, so we realized that how we source, like where we source our wood from, the forest management of that forest can, that can have a bigger swing on carbon emissions than the product that we get. So what I'm trying to say is, um, okay, over on the right, you have the emissions, like the cradle gated carbon emissions, from that wood product, this is for uh, 1,000 board, 10,000 board feet. Um, and, but then we talk about introduce biogenic carbon, the carbon that was stored in the product, um, that's that big dip, the same dip that you saw on that chart before. And then that additional one on the left is just because of sourcing from a forest that more responsibly managed its, its stock, its, its living you know, trees basically, um, but also soils. Um, so, uh, you know, we can have that additional difference that is actually um, even more than what's stored in the product. So this concept um, you can read more about in this white paper that my colleague uh, wrote and published on, on Um And I just, yeah, I just really, I think that this is where, you know, where we source our materials from, even structural materials. Uh, it just, you know, it, it's, to me, it's really pressing to be aware of this. 
Um, but the opportunity at the same time, the opportunity then with Mass Timber, I think is what is really neat is that we can have this beneficial influence on the forest as well as um, replacing steel and concrete because mass timber can do that. Other forest products like the before mass timber um, are lumber, softwood lumber, um, you know, that is limited. It's, it's, it wouldn't really replace concrete or steel, but mass timber can actually replace concrete or steel. So now we're talking about substitution because we don't want to, there's no, it's, it's not sensible to just say, okay, now we're gonna, we just have to wood, you know, use wood for everything. Um, it's really, and, and then like, like have more single family homes that are just made out of wood and sprawling. We need to bring that use of wood that is substituting concrete and steel, um, uh, which is the higher, denser um, buildings. And, and that's gonna be in our urban cores. And, and so we can help reduce sprawl because of this way of building. Um, okay, and then lastly is the concept of designing for circularity. Um, has, uh, yeah, I'm kind of just curious if people have heard of this concept too. You like just raise your hand. Like, great, okay. Um, so one of the fundamentals to think about is that if we can start building, uh, designing our buildings and thinking about their layers, there's layers to our buildings. Um, this is a concept that comes from um, How Buildings Learned by Stuart Brand, that's another book. Um, and, and that these different layers have different lives. They're defined by the different lives they have in our buildings. Um, so the site, the structure, you know, it's very permanent, um, but all these other layers are, um, you know, it, it, the, they churn through our buildings more frequently. And we don't, what we do right now, the way we build, we often end up destroying or damaging the layers that are meant to be more permanent when we wanna just replace the stuff that has a quicker, a, a shorter service life. Um, so if we could decouple them and think of them in layers um, and how things can be replaced only when, only the part that needs to be replaced gets replaced, then, um, then that, that really helps. Um, and and the, so that's the first step to this concept of design for deconstruction. Um, and then another really important concept is that uh, we need better documentation of our building products because um, a lot of time the, the hurdle is that okay, something that meets its end of life, but then there's no enough information about it for someone else to do something useful with it and to take on, then there's too much you know, risk to take on. So um, having better documentation, we uh, took these concepts and, and uh, worked with the team for, to create the circular building, which is a demonstration project that was done in London. And it, you know, some of the um, uh, design um, uh, behind it just shows like, you know, how that thinking was carried out. Um, and going back to this, what you saw earlier, it's just, you know, I feel like I wanna relate it back to uh, these concepts and, and point out how design for circularity, it takes on the form of design for flexibility, adaptability, deconstruction and reuse. And it's really to help enable another project to be able to do all these things, right? So, okay, it'd be great. It's great our project is doing these things, but then actually designing for um, all the elements of your building to be useful for another project um, is, is where this idea of designing for circularity comes in. Um, and it's really tackling this problem we have right now of having a very linear economy. We you know, have this pattern of take, make, use, and then dispose. A uh, circular economy is, is thinking about how can we turn waste into nutrients, into resources, and have it um, become cyclical and you know, use, re you know, then we can minimize our resources enormously, eliminate waste, and just have a much more regenerative um, renewable system. And if you're interested in this concept, then there's more to read here. Um, uh, all of this is, uh, is in our partnership, through our partnership with Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and so all of it's on their website. Uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation is the is like the global kind of um, organization and network for a circular economy out of the UK. Um, and um, the other resource I really like is um, building a circular future, but by three XN, GXN, and design for disassembly. They point out is just one piece. Um, you also need that documentation, which is what we call the material passport. 
um, you need it to have a strong business case. And then can you start to make your buildings uh, like material banks? So thinking of our buildings is it's like, you know, that that building's life is just the agglomeration of, of all these pieces working together, but all those pieces can have value. And that's just a, it's just your building is a bank of, of those materials, but those materials can move live on and, and um, provide value to another building later and, and so on and so on. And the last thing to point out for a circular building is um, our circular building tools kit. You can look this up online. It's for it's free to use, um, and you can just you know be in here forever and explore it more. You'll look see these again these themes being very familiar, starting with build nothing and going towards the uh, lastly building with the right materials. Um, okay, so I think I'm actually at time uh, close to time now. So I'm gonna I'm gonna skip. Uh, some of this, because um, a lot of this is about measurement, um, and and I think I just really want to get to um, this last, the, the last thing to leave with you guys um, is is the architect and structural engineer working together. Um, when you enter the profession, you're probably going to find that there's a there are these commitment programs, SC twenty fifty for structural engineers, or architecture or AIA twenty thirty for architects, um, really trying to tackle you know uh, our um, the, the impact that we have on the climate. And um, uh, it's pretty easy to kind of be down there where the, you know, you're kind of doing something rather giving information, you know, from one from engineer to the architect, and then they report it and, and it's kind of transactional. Um, and then this one is a, a, the SE 2050 program uh, where the architect would ask the structural engineer to, to calculate the embodied carbon and learn from it a bit. But, um, but both, it's you know one person asking for information from another, and, and then it comes across. Ideally, is what we're really hoping our you know our program is really trying to encourage is that uh, the structural engineer is engaged earlier on and working with the architect to reduce body carbon. That when we perform our calcs, we're also ensuring accuracy of quantities and and verifying that the high impact sources um, are, are true or like sensible or rational. And then um, and and make, recommending some realistic reductions for the project, um, and then there's a continuous dialogue over the course of the project, and and that's you know where we really hope that um, the the two commitment programs were were really trying to get the you know our two memberships to work together that way, um, and and then just reflecting, you know, I said that things this climate wasn't really in the conversation when I started as a structural engineer. I felt like there was this green building movement that was taking off and structural engineers were getting left behind. Um, and now, now like after almost 20 years, um, there's been quite a shift. Building Green is one of the really trusted sources for um, the green building uh, industry at, and uh, their uh, yeah, journal basically. Um, and um, uh, they've yeah pointed out that in inviting a creative structural engineer to join your team is one of the the best way is to have the greenest building possible. And, um, and I, I tend to agree. Thank you. <laughs>